In this week's update, I'm excited. Target stocks just got sharply cheaper. US big tech gets killed, but better overall signs for US stocks. My name's Gary Davis. As always, this is general advice only. And you can lose money in the stock market. Almost everybody knows that. And that's why I've been doing these, these market videos for years and years. And I believe it's a perspective that I think is valuable in improving your performance. All right, let's start with the market pers uh, perspective. Um, I'm not really terribly concerned about what the indices are doing. It's really only the, the movement of the indices has an impact on sentiment. But specifically, uh, as it relates to, to my portfolio, it really doesn't have very much impact at all. So I don't really mind too much <coughs> whether the indices are still in a, uh, a bear market, uh, a back into a bull market, or, um, or what they're doing. Um, I'm just really interested in what my targets are. I'm very clear about what I'm after, the entry prices that I'm after. And um, I've got a, uh, a medium to long-term plan. I really don't do any sort of short-term trading. I just think that's far too hard in these, uh, in these sort of markets. In, in fact, let me just show you a chart of, uh, this is just one example. Uh, but this is a U.S. stock uh, called Albemarle in, um, in lithium. And I just want to take, let's just rewind this a week or two so that we can see what this looked like. So when you get a candle like that, you're generally on alert. So a pretty negative candle and really accelerated volumes. Sorry. Then the next day we get a huge gap down and it then trades up. And so you would look at that and good volume, you would look at that and think, well, that's a pretty handy sort of reversal. And so it turned out to be, but not so much the next day because the next day looks even worse. So at that point, if you were trying to short-term trade this, you'd be in and out and in and out. It'd be, you know, it's almost impossible to understand what this sort of price action um, is, is doing and where the price is going to go from there. Then the following day, a bit indecisive, and then so the week progresses, and we ended up quite positive. But these three or four days around here, it's it's just a virtual impossibility to try and trade that with, um, with any sort of uh, confidence. So that's... Yeah, that's how I approach the market. Just get really targeted, really focused and try and shut out the noise. Now, some of my target stocks, and I've got many, just got cheaper because of some of this very erratic volatility that is completely illogical. But because I'm really clear about what I'm doing, then, you know, some of those stocks are now into my target zone. I've got plenty of cash to utilize because of the way that I've positioned throughout this year. Um, so, you know, that's, um, that's a, a positive and I'm following my plan, which is delivering what I expected. Um, you know, I get, uh, get, get lots of nasty red days, but, um, I get, uh, I get plenty of, uh, really nice green days as well. So that just all adds to the confidence that I can bring to, to the stock market. And that's, that's the really important thing, because if you feel really clear and confident about what you're doing then you know you, you can just sit back and observe a lot of this day-to-day -day volatility without getting spooked by it and, and end up making um, you know unfortunate decisions. So the message here is that if you're not really highly organized, this market is really tough. This is as hard a market as I've experienced in 35 years. And the risks are significant. So if you're um, if you're uh, stomping around in the market uh, and you're not highly organized and highly targeted, then um, I suggest you probably should stop doing it pretty quickly. All right, US economic data is providing both good and bad news. Um, the good news is, just in the last uh, day or so, is that third quarter GDP is growing again. So from a purely economic point of view, um, you know, that's that's a good thing. However, we've we've got a market at the moment where, you know, <clears throat> good news is bad news for prices because good news is seen as the Fed likely to, um, you know, to ratchet up the rate rises. 
And I guess the other observation is that the rate rises that the Fed has brought in so far seem to have had very little impact on uh, inflation. Now, there's no real surprise there because there's always a, a decent lag between raising rates and actually seeing the impact in the economy. So that's probably not surprising. And and the risk here is that the Fed goes too far and keeps raising rates until it becomes evident um, in the inflation data. But by then they've done they've done too much damage, and it can't be quickly reversed because they've you know they've really push the uh, the US economy to recessionary conditions. So, you know, I've been saying that all year. In fact, I've been saying that since 2020, that the, um, the one of the real risks to the stock market was uh, was central bank policy error. Um, the savings rate is at its lowest level since 2005. Now, what that means is that the consumer is getting horribly squeezed. And, and this is a theme all around the world and certainly applies in Australia as well. So, you know, to me, that means that consumer discretionary stocks have got a huge headwind. And that doesn't mean that all of them are going to be impacted badly. But the odds are against consumer discretionary stocks. So, you know, that's probably a part of the market that you want to avoid or, or minimise because further cost increases uh, are virtually assured um, in all sorts of areas of, uh, of the economy. Sector, sector selection, critical. Industry group selection, absolutely critical. And, um, you know, if, you, if you're looking to have a broadly diversified portfolio, then, you know, the reality is that only narrow parts of the market have performed in the last uh, 10 months. Um, so if you've got a broadly based uh, portfolio, then a lot of your portfolio is, is underperforming. And looking forward, I just can't see how that's going to change. So I think that the focus needs to be on those very narrow sections of, um, of the market that, uh, that are performing. OK, just before I go on to uh, American stocks, um, I'll just make a quick point here. Um, there are an increasing number of questions getting asked on, on these YouTube videos that are just not possible for me to answer for, for several reasons. Firstly, they're asking for direct advice, which is you know really personal advice. Um, they don't provide any context, um, and, I, you know, and I don't want any context. Um, so there's, it's impossible for me to provide a response to, to a number of those questions. This is a general advice service only, um, and I just can't answer them. Um, I don't get any ad revenue from these YouTube videos, as, as you know, many, many people do. Uh, we don't. Um, these are just valuable videos for my members. That's most important. But they also serve as, as, a, as, you know, as a bit of a marketing tool for anyone who, who likes my philosophy and my approach to the market. You know, it makes sense to them. It aligns with how they want to operate. Um, and also, of course, as I said earlier, I, I do them because it provides an independent, objective perspective that I think is needed to just cut through all the rubbish and all the ill-informed content that's out there. If you've got questions, there is a $1 membership trial for two weeks where you can ask those questions in Portfolio Analyst. Um, I can prepare for those questions adequately. Um, it's still strictly general advice only in those responses, but it's it's a lot of factual detail and it's in video format, which you know might be beneficial for, for some people. So if you've got questions, then join Portfolio Analyst Trial and, and ask them in that forum. That's by far the best place to do it. Okay, US American stocks. The S&P, for the record, rose nearly 4% for the week. Um, and that was despite the fact that um, most of the big tech stocks, most of the FANG stocks got killed, absolutely killed, anywhere from 10 to 20 odd percent down in a single session. And yet the S&P still managed to rise 3.9% for the week. And, you know, the all the rest of the news that will likely lead to further rate rises and 
There's even suggestions now that the, the Fed could start to go up in 1% increments. Um, frankly, I don't believe that, and I hope it's not the case because, uh, you know, I think that'll really guarantee that, that we get a, a severe recession. Um, but look, there's part of the reason for the fact that big tech earnings were less than the market expected is that there's been some significant changes that largely um, were brought in by Apple that are, are really impacting ad revenues. And, and a lot of the big tech stocks, uh, such as you know Meta and Google in particular, uh, rely on ad revenue. And um, you know, it's part of their business model. And it's affecting that. So, you know, there's, there's perhaps the, the start of a, um, of a longer term change here. Um, so that was a pretty amazing performance. And, and when I went through my workbook of US stocks, which is, has about 200 stocks in them, it's starkly obvious how many finish the week off really well. You know, when, when I saw the, the treatment handed out to, to Google and, and Microsoft and Meta and Amazon um, during the week, you know, I thought it was going to be a very nasty week, setting a very poor tone, and yet the market managed, the index managed to turn up. And that was because just so many other stocks did, uh, did well. So the really important message here is just don't take your cues from, from the indices. If you're watching the indices and making decisions on that basis, you're just not playing the, the, the game the way that it needs to be played. US dollar index uh, fell to uh, 110.72, um, which tells you that the yield probably backed off, and, and it did. And this is all at a time when the news just is seemingly getting worse and worse. The VIX fell under 26. You know, what, why is that? Why would the VIX fall when there's all this bad news around? And uh, Look, I don't have a definitive answer, but it's something along the lines of, Markets are oversold. There are signs that we're getting some peaks in, in inflation. Maybe it's not in the headline data, but it's in some of the things that contribute to inflation. You know, it's, it's time. You know, it's seasonally. It's, it's a good time for the market to start to rally from oversold. Now, this might turn out just to be another bear market rally. But as I said at the start, I'm not burning up any energy worrying about whether it is or it isn't because it's pointless. I'm just really focused on my targets, my portfolio composition that I want and, and the entry levels that, you know, that are attractive to me that, that reduce risk. The 10-2 spread widened again out to um, negative 0.4 almost. So, um, you know, we, we just all need to hope that the Fed just doesn't go too hard here. All right, let's look at some charts. So let me, just, uh, let me just go through some of the big tech charts. This is Meta, Facebook, previously. It's fallen 74% in 13 months. It was up here at $385. Now we're down just a tick under 100. And you can see the impact. So, you know, to me, this is a business model that's broken. And, um, you know, they're in serious trouble. Look at the impact. Um, down over 20% on, uh, on Thursday uh, into earnings and, and huge volumes. Amazon, similarly, uh, down on Thursday, reported after market, market didn't like it, huge gap down on Friday, managed to trade up a bit, but still a net, um, you know, very substantial loss. Google, pretty similar, huge gap down on, uh, on Wednesday. Further selling on uh, Thursday, and then managed with the um, you know the turnaround to um, have a bit of a jump up on Friday. Microsoft didn't escape, although their result was um, their result was pretty good. Uh, it certainly beat expectations, top and bottom line. But um, but you know Microsoft still got sold off Wednesday and Thursday. Managed a good turnaround though on Friday. Apple was one of the few of the large tech. Uh, large cap tech stocks that actually did well. The market liked their, their earnings. And so Apple went up and, and that perhaps helped the sentiment in the market to, uh, to turn around. And then there are other stocks. 
again, these just aren't recommendations. These are just observations of, of stocks that I see. This is Visa, you know, an extremely positive uh, week in response to, um, to earnings. And just one other chart that I think is relevant. This is HYG. This is the, effectively the, you know, the, the proxy for the junk bond market heading back up again. You know, this, you wouldn't normally expect to see this with all the bad news unless we're close to an extreme and a turning point. So that was a real positive, huge positive on, um, uh, on Friday. Okay. Turning now to um, to Aussie stocks, and I will go back and look at the currencies uh, in a minute when we go back to the charts. But the Australian dollar, uh, sixty three and a half, is where it finished. We're still looking at the next support level being down at sixty, so that's still possible. Our index was up one point six percent across the week, um, despite the fact that we had a um, a pretty significant drop in in the the iron ore majors. Um, and I suspect from the reaction on Friday that, that that was a bit of a sentiment shift and it was an opportunity to take some profit in, uh, in the battery material stocks as well, which had run, you know, very, very hard. All right, let's now go look at uh, some uh, of the, the key charts. So just for the record, these are the indices. This is the S&P managed to get back above the... Um, 50 day moving average, the blue line. So it's getting there. We've now got a higher high. We don't have a higher low yet. Um, or I, I guess we do here. So there's a long way to go yet for the index, but um, it, it's the start. But look, is, is this just another rally like this one was, like this one was? Well, I don't know. And I'm not, I'm not too concerned about it, to be honest. Uh, let's look at uh, the NASDAQ, not quite as uh, robust as the S&P, so the NASDAQ is still underperforming, hasn't made it back to the 50-day moving average yet, and just doesn't look as robust. And so that's a, you know, that's a bit of a, a cooler for me, because for the, for the market to move back into a uh, you know, bullish phase, you really need the aggressive sectors, which the NASDAQ reflects. To, uh, to be doing better than what it is. But look, certainly big tech had a significant negative effect. The small caps have actually done pretty well. So this, this argues the other way now that, um, you know, with small caps doing pretty well, that, uh, you know, it's back now just at the 200 day moving average that, you know, that's a bit of a positive sign. So let's look at the money flows um, in intramarket um, this is, uh, that's, sorry, that's GDX, um, okay. So this is um, the mid US mid-cap growth versus the S&P. And, um, you know, quite a, quite a decent week considering, um, you know, considering what went on in some parts of the market. So the small caps and mid-caps not doing too badly. Um, semiconductors did kick up on Friday. So that was a bit of a, a bit of a, um, a glimmer of hope there that uh, that semiconductor stocks actually did pretty well on Friday. This consumer discretionary versus consumer staples getting um, yeah really getting uh, hit hard. So consumer discretionary for me definitely a sector to uh, to avoid or be extremely cautious about. This is the Nasdaq versus the S and P. Um, so we're still. You know, we're still quite clearly trending down. That means that the S&P is being favoured relative to the NASDAQ. We've broken key support and um, it's a fairly sharp move to the downside. Uh, 1,000 growth versus 1,000 value. Um, the, on the negative side, you'd say, well, this ratio is falling, so that's not good. On the positive side, if you want to put a positive spin on it, at the moment, we've not broken these lows that we saw in in May. Um, so at the moment, we're still at a at a higher uh, at a higher low. So that's one to continue watching. This is large cap growth versus large cap value on a weekly chart, uh, falling away um, quite quite sharply there. 
Um, and finally, this is small cap um, growth versus small cap value. So no real tick up there. So these ratio spreads, you know, are, are not too exciting if, if, you're, a, if you're a bullish trader. Um, we're not getting a lot of, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of heads up from, from that area. But as I said, looking at when you go and look at a couple of hundred individual stock charts, Boy, oh boy, there was a lot of really, really promising uh, charts, I have to say. So, you know, the jury's still out for me, um, but it comes back to the same thing that I keep hammering all the time. Just, you know, focus on what is of interest to you and forget the rest. US dollar index eased back a bit, eased back to the 50-day moving average, but still trending higher. And as a consequence, our currency is doing the opposite. It's, uh, it's heading, uh, heading lower. There's just a couple of, um, couple of charts I'll just show while I'm here. So there's the 10-year um, the yield. Let's look at the 10-year yield over the last uh, six months because this is just so important for the market. So it bottomed out in, uh, in August. And then the mark, the the yield has gone on a real tear. So we've gone from gone from around 2.75 to up to about 4.3, uh, and backed off a little bit. Um, but you've still got to say that the trend here is still higher. And if the Fed keep doing what they're doing, then this is going to head higher. That's for sure. The VIX. If we look at this on a six monthly basis, you can see the VIX is now starting to come come off its highs. Um, which doesn't make a lot of sense, but uh, I guess uh, some of the smarter market players are, um, are reducing their, um, their exposure to the downside. Now, one other chart that's relevant, this is uh, for Australia. This is the iron ore price. Um, you can see a very sharp fall uh, last week in the, uh, in the iron ore price, and that's certainly what, what played out in... Um, in the case of BHP and Rio and, and Fortescue in particular, um, at the end of uh, the end of last week. All right, moving on to other things: precious metals, gold down by thirteen dollars to um, sixteen forty-six in US dollars. Um, lost a little bit of ground in Aussie dollars because the gold price fell by more than our currency. So we're just a tick under twenty-six hundred, but that's still pretty profitable territory. But look, right now, the market isn't, isn't interested at all in Australian uh, producing gold stocks. There is some interest in emerging developers and emerging producers. And that's, you know, that's the area of, of interest for me. Um, the personal consumption expenditure report that came out on Friday almost assures a 0.75% rate rise by the Fed in November. And that's bad for gold. Um, so, you know, there's no other way to, to paint the picture. And if, um, you know, if the current calls for the Fed to go up to uh, 1% uh, were to flow through, then, yeah, it just gets even worse for gold. And the reason being is because gold doesn't pay a, a yield, doesn't pay a dividend, then, you know, it loses its attractiveness for some large parts of the market. So as yields rise, then you know, people are, some people are less inclined to want to own gold as, a, um, uh, as an asset. Now, for the GDXJ, it's really nothing much uh, has changed there. So let's just check those couple of charts. So first of all, this is, uh, this is gold. On a, uh, on a daily basis. So you can see the moving averages are all rolled over. They're all heading down and there's been no change. We've still got the, the green 20 day moving average line below the 50. They're all pointing down and the price is below all of them. So, you know, it's a downtrend. Um, we broke vital support. We've got a little bit of a short term consolidation on a big picture level. Um, but certainly the, the, you know, the trend is, is down, that's for sure. If we look at uh, a GDXJ, which reflects uh, most of the miners, perhaps you could argue that this is looking slightly better than the actual gold price itself because it's really going more sideways than, 
than falling, but look, there's not a lot of difference um, between the two. Just a question that I thought I would uh, I would touch on is just with respect to currency relationships. You know, the Australian dollar, um, you know, versus gold. So obviously, I think you know, for most people, that's pretty obvious that um, a falling Australian dollar, if if the U.S. dollar gold price is steady and the Australian dollar is falling, then our Australian dollar gold price is obviously going to go up. Um, so I think everyone should be you know, pretty clear on what's happening there. And the same thing applies to, to oil and, uh, and other commodities that are priced in US dollars. Um, as far as the Australian dollar, you know, either a rising or falling Australian dollar, how does that impact um, company profits and, uh, and hence the share prices? Look, there's, there's several different impacts depending on the company. So there's no overall statement that you can make here or overall conclusion that you can make. Some companies are, um, you know, if, if they're importing a lot of their raw materials, then a lower Australian dollar makes those imports more expensive. And so if they can't pass those costs on to the consumer or to their, you know, to their customers, then, um, you know, that's going to squeeze their, uh, their profit margins. For other companies, if they're making um, a significant part of their earnings overseas, and they may not be directly impacted by rising costs, but when they translate those earnings back to Australian dollars, you know they they look uh, they either look better or worse depending on what the currency is doing. So there's really no overall. You've just got to look at it on a on a case by case uh, basis, and and the impacts are different for different companies. Other commodities, copper, up a little bit to 345 nickel also up just a touch to almost $10. But look, the outlook is still really, really positive. If you look at the London Metals Exchange copper inventories, um, just recently they were down to less than two days of, um, of inventory, which is you know almost nothing. Um, yet commodity prices have, have been under pressure all year because of fears about re recession. But you would think with less than two days of inventory that prices would be rising. But look, it's, you know, we've, we've got a bit of a disconnect here. The, the, there are fears about the China COVID lockdowns. There are fears about the property turmoil in China. And of course, the US dollar strength has impacted um, the copper price as well, in the same way that I just spoke about with respect to gold. So... Um, there is a disconnect between fears about recession and, and what that might do to copper uh, demand and nickel demand um, with the physical reality. And the physical reality is in so many uh, metals, base metals, and also critical metals, the physical reality is that they're already in deficit and supply can't possibly keep up with the increasing demand. So... It's not happening at the moment, but there, you know, there is a there is a time coming, and it's going to be an extended period of time that it lasts, when you know this supply demand imbalance um, is is going to play out in significantly higher commodity prices, and therefore significantly higher commodity stock prices. You know, the the only the only risk to that is that the world suddenly decides that decarbonisation is not you know, is not an issue anymore and climate change isn't an issue anymore. And, you know, let's face it, that's just not going to happen. Everyone is too committed to um, to decarbonisation. So that's copper and nickel. Um, crude oil uh, went up a little bit, 88.37, and the energy sector in America certainly, um, you know, continues to rise very strongly. So, you know, don't fight the tide if if the, if the stocks and the sectors that you're interested in are, are going down, then, you know, don't buy them. Buy things that are, that are going up with, um, you know, with a highly probable future outlook. There's a spot copper chart. It's hard to see on this chart, but a little bit of a gain uh, towards the end of the week. Here's the inventories on a five-year basis. So you can see that over the last five years, this really is extremely low. Uh, this is narrowing in a little bit more. This is the, the last 30 days. So we did get an increase um, 
to uh, about 146,000 tonnes, but now it's back right off. And uh, you know, I'm not quite sure what caused that bit of a bit of a spike. Um, you know, there's a lot of things happening as a result of the Russia-Ukraine war and and you know sanctions against Russia and and um, you know we don't need to understand it. We've just got to know that we're going through a period of disruption. There's a spot nickel chart. So finished about ten dollars. Uh, there's nickel stocks over the last uh, five years as well. Um, you know, they're extremely low and not showing any signs of turning up at this stage. So my final thoughts to wrap it all up. This is not a prediction that we've seen the lows, but I just make the observation that this is the type of environment of extreme negativity that major lows are made of. You know, this is when major lows happen, when, when all the news is bad, and the, the obvious conclusion, the logical conclusion is the stock market can't possibly go up. It can only go down. And, th you know, that sort of sentiment always occurs at, uh, at major bottoms. So this could be one of them. The news is terrible. Big tech got killed. I must admit, I expected the market to perform a lot worse because of those earnings results for those big companies. Um, but the, the other, on the other side of things, this is the time of year. We've, we've had a, a poor September. We've had a poor October. And, um, you know, November, December, after that sort of period of September, October, is so often is really quite positive. And as I've been saying, there are numerous very highly positive chart patterns um, in um, in US stocks. So, you know, what I'm seeing on the ground is um, is telling a different story altogether. If, you, if you're worrying about, you know, whether we've seen the index bottom or not, then you're asking yourself the wrong question. It just, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. Portfolio analysts last week, uh, we looked at aged care as a, as a mega trend. Um, and also the, the top end of my, so my most favoured uh, critical metal stocks that are on my on my watch list. Now, as far as the weekly Sunday video goes, it, it's unlikely that I'll be able to do one for the next two weeks. I'm I'm going to be uh, travelling on and off, and um, as uh, as soon as I get back from that, I'll be in hospital for some um, shoulder surgery. So um, the next couple of weeks, um, yeah, you you may not get a um, an update, but um, you know, let's uh, let's just see where the market goes. So that's it for this week. There's my email address, and um, there's more information on our website. So um, I'll be uh, I'll be back with you in a few weeks' time. Cheers.